building a world-class veteran hiring program. That's next on the RecTech Podcast, featuring the August Jobsing Roundtable. If you're looking to make a difference while supporting your vet, our veterans out there, listen to this engaging roundtable discussion with Leah Daniels and Alex Murphy from Jobsync with their speakers, uh, veterans Chris Miles from Sonapar and Stephen Jenke from Semper Forward will share their valuable insights uh, garnered from years of experience in military relations and talent pipeline development. Enjoy the audio. Welcome to RecTech, the podcast where recruiting and technology intersect. Each month, you'll hear from vendors shaping the recruiting world, along with recruiters who'll tell you how they use technology to hire talent. Now, here's your host, the mad scientist of online recruiting, Chris Russell. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the JobSync Roundtable. It is August. For those of you who are keeping track, and I'm really excited today. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a gentleman here named Chris Miles. I'm going to have him introduce himself in a moment at a conference. I think the two of us were hiding from the conference, if I recall correctly, and uh, we ended up co-hiding. I think that's a the activity one does. And I was super impressed in chatting with Chris around some of the work he's been doing at Sonapar and building a uh, military hiring program. So I did ask him to join us today. And I said, who do you know that would be awesome that could, could also contribute to this conversation? And he said, I got this guy. You're going to love him. His name is Steve. So Steve Janke, he's joined us as well. Steve, did I say your name right? Uh, no, it's Yankee. Yankee. But it's, it's okay. Usually when, usually when I get to places or show up, things are going to get janky. Well, that makes sense. See, I, I like it. Yankee to Janky. It's okay. I had a maiden last name that nobody could say to save their life. So I completely understand the challenge. So I asked them to join us today. We're going to talk about how you go about building internally a world-class or at least a U.S. class military hiring program. Uh, and, and there's a few things in here that I'm really uh, excited to talk about. And for those of you who don't know, I am married to a former service member as well. He spent six years in the National Guard. I was telling Chris earlier today because I did not spend any time in the military that I am extraordinarily stupid about a lot of this stuff. And I was like, you must have a number. Like your unit had a number, right? And he's like, yeah, I was in the 1110. And I was like, the 1100. He's like, no, the 1110. And I was like, I don't know what that means. He said, I was in the first cavalry 110. And I was like, oh, okay, got it. And the reason I left a little bit when he said that is because for many years I giggled on my very first date with my husband, because he told me he was in the cavalry. And I was like, this date's going really well. Cause I grew up on horses and he rode horses. And you know what the army doesn't do horses, horses. I was, <laughs> so halfway through the date, I find out there's no horses involved. And he said, no, we didn't ride horses. We rode tanks. Damn it. So close. Anyway, it worked out. So today I'm going to have first, I'll tell you guys all a little bit about JobSync, then Chris and Steve are going to both introduce themselves and then we're going to jump right into our topic at hand. Just a couple of housekeeping things for the day. You all have your cameras hot, your mics hot. That means if you'd like to jump in and be part of the conversation, we would love for you to jump in and be part of the conversation. So please feel free to bring your own questions, thoughts, perspective, experiences, and, and make this more of an interactive uh, conversation rather than just the three of us having a little chit chat. And those for you who have not met us before, JobSync is a hiring operations platform. We're really focused on how do you operationalize all the pieces of the hiring process, particularly around the recruitment marketing components today, although increasingly we find ourselves in other areas. Most of our clients work with us because they have a need to bring in a lot more candidates, typically two or three X, what they're typically seeing. And we're able to do that with them pretty efficiently, day one impact. And that has lots of down funnel results for them around hitting hiring plans more efficiently at lower costs. So if that's something interesting, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you about it. So let's get started. Chris, can you first give us a little background on you? I'm happy to do your background, but I think you might tell the story a little better than I would. Yeah, so I joined the military when I was 17 years old, born and raised in Du Bois, Pennsylvania. Joined the military like a lot of other service members do because there were no jobs in my area. My parents couldn't afford school. So I decided, hey, I'm going to join. I'll go for the GI Bill. I'll stay for three years and I'll even go to school. Well, 26 years later, I left the service. So I left with a wife, two kids, you know, and I have a grandson. 
I did the full gamut, you know, retired military. I'm also a military spouse, military dad, and military grandpa. I was a combat engineer for 26 years. I'm a retired star major. I was the command star major of 62nd Engineer Battalion. So I had a demolitions, explosive, combat construction background, which works well coming into Sonopar because we're the world's largest electrical distribution organization globally. And so I already kind of understood where our career path was and what we we're doing. My path, and that's why I think it fits so well into the military veteran recruiting space. As I went through in transition and when I was a SAR major, I started working with the transition assistance program, building programs for construction related experience to the outside. So whenever I went to transition, I went through the hiring our heroes on board recruit military events. So I was a fellow, I did all those pieces. So I was able to understand the entire way the organization. And then I accidentally fell into the military recruiting space. I was working as a fellow in military employee resource from ADP automated data processing. And then as I was going from a manager looking for a promotion, uh, I saw that there was a role for the military uh, RPO recruiting team. So I started working on the Bell Tower, assisting with uh, Nick and Romero on other accounts that we were running. And then two and a half years ago, Sonapar came looking. Uh, we had a conversation and started building out the program. Awesome. And Steve, I'm going to have you also give your background, and then I've got a couple of good questions to get us started. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. My, my story is one of the soil, one of service, one of roots. It's one of the, the great state of Wisconsin. I'm a fifth generation recovering dairy farmer. And when I graduated high school, I was going to be a dairy farmer, right? So I went to the University of Wisconsin Platteville for a semester. And I was one of those kids that, that found classes were optional and there was beer and Nintendo. So I'm like dating myself a little bit, but they didn't get my tuition check for the second semester. So I did what every really intelligent person does is I joined the Marine Corps right? Because if you're going to do it, you're going to be the best. But I also knew that I wanted the challenge and I was looking for, and I was probably the only one a recruiter didn't lie to because I told my recruiter, I said, I want a, I want to do a, a military occupational specialty with no practical application in the real world. So he said to me, I'm all out of infantry. Have you ever heard of field artillery? And I was off, like never heard anything of it, but Kings of Battle, I was a Marine that could read and do math. So I ended up in the fire direction control, playing with charts and darts for four years. My transition out of the Marine Corps was uniquely simple because I was going to be a dairy farmer. So I got picked up at Madison, Wisconsin at the Dane County Regional Airport by my family. I was milking cows that night and I proceeded to do that for the next 15 years. Coned and operated the family dairy farm. About 2009, I realized the economics of a, a small family farm in the great state of Wisconsin was probably not gonna be the path forward. So I started building my transition plan. And what naturally segues from farming when you're working with cows all the time and shoveling manure, politics, right? Government service. So I went from physically shoveling manure to verbally doing it. And I got into government service, ended up working for the, the great state of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, where the governor asked my boss, the secretary of the department to create a talent attraction initiative to bring veterans and their families to the great state of Wisconsin. So my boss, the secretary, shot me a text. And he's like, hey, can you do this? And I was like, absolutely. This is an easy day. Let's go. So I showed up to a meeting and I started in 2017 building out an internationally recognized best practice in veteran and military recruiting for the great state of Wisconsin. And then administrations changed, COVID happened. They let me go and ended the program in June of 2020. So I started a company called Mission Wisconsin to fulfill the promise that I made to all those service members and their families that the great state of Wisconsin would be there for them like it had been since 1848. And Mission Wisconsin was born and it still exists to this day. We just rolled over into a national brand called Semper Ford. We are a for-profit organization that helps companies build military talent pipelines through marketing, outreach, events, and retention consulting. So we want to help, we're gonna, we're gonna send them fish, but we also wanna help teach them how to fish, right? I feel like the relationship between talent and organizations is a little too transactional, which is why we're not an agency. We want it to be relationship driven. So there we go. And that's my story. And here I am now. Semper Ford is rolling into year, year two and national brand. We attend probably 50 in-person hiring events on military bases around the world. 
That's amazing. Chris just put something into the chat. I want to just mention to everybody that we often have two conversations running. So feel free to throw information into the chat as well as just live here. I want to start kind of simply and then we're going to dig in pretty deep. I think a lot of people understand on the surface level what is military hiring. You're hiring vets, you're hiring people exiting the military, but what does that actually mean to a company, to recruiting teams, to hiring managers? What are the component pieces that everyone needs to be thinking about just on a high level? And then we, I want to dig into a lot of the, the tactical specific stuff as a secondary. Do you, Chris, want I mean, to take that first or Steve, you want to jump in? I mean, yeah. the, easiest, like the, the, the easiest way, right, is military and veteran hiring is like boiling the ocean. There are so many ways that you can get lost in what you want to do that you never start because it becomes so overwhelming. What we recommend when companies approach us about building that that pipeline and doing it correctly, we say start with one, hire a veteran, right? And then hire another one, and then hire one after that. And then eventually, you're going to be hiring veterans. When you get enough of them, ask them, hey, what could we do to improve the process? Tell us your story, share that. So it's really like throwing a rock in the pond to keep the water analogy going and seeing the ripples expand outwards. But the key to starting a military hiring program is to hire one. Yeah, Chris. I would tell you when you're looking at a program that you have to sit back and say, okay, what are my goals? You know, so any any organization, sit down with them like, look, you need to be military friendly, military ready. I think it's as easy as putting a flag out front of your organization saying you're military friendly. That is not what it is. The other baseline piece that I would tell you is start off by spending no money on your program. You know, go to SHRM, take the, there's a Veterans at Work certificate program, complete that, that way you any of veterans, if you don't have somebody in that space, and get the basic understanding of what is going on. There are a ton of free entities out there that you can take and utilize first before you go spend any money. I watch a lot of companies go out there and just try and spend money at the problem, and that's a way to just that's a way just to fail. Uh, unless, said, oh, go ahead, go ahead. It's, it's unless you spend the money with us, then, then ah. you're, not, you're building a credit. <laughs> Looking for your next HR technology role? Go to your browser, type in hrtechjob.com, and browse hundreds of jobs with the best HR technology vendors. HR tech professionals finally have a dedicated job marketplace to find work or be found. Sign up for job alerts or post a resume. Discover jobs with companies like Workday, Phenom, HiBob, Deal, and more. You'll even find HR tech roles with employers in case you want to work with managing HCM or HRIS platforms. HR Tech Job, the only job market for HR technology careers. Join us at hrtechjob.com. Chris, one of the things you just said, the, the first sentence was, what is your goal? What is your purpose, right? I think this is actually where companies get lost right as they start. Why are you hiring somebody with a specific set of experience that you may not understand? And I actually think that might be part of where we all go sideways before we even get to the throwing the flag and hiring. Why and what value are we bringing to the organization and how do we set a goal around that? Steve is spot on because when most companies are like, well, we want to take and do it so that we're OSCCP VEVRA compliant. That's great, but you have to start somewhere. So make your first goal. You know, so we have over 20 organizations within Sona Park. You know, if we're going with that baseline, let's make a school. Everybody buddy, hire, hire one veteran. Everybody bring on one DOD school bridge candidate. Everybody bring on one military spouse. That way then everybody understands what the process is, how to move forward with the process, and the value that the veteran community actually brings to an organization. So that could be a baseline goal. Instead, what you'll see is companies will come out and say, all right, you know, if, if the 5.2 percentage for OFCCP of ever compliance is our goal, then we need to hire 300 veterans this year. That's just going to be a measure of failure because you're just going to be trying to hire, just trying to meet, meet that goal without actually putting a program in place, make sure the training, the education, and the career goals align with what the, what the service member and veteran community out aligns with. As you build out that program, do you have enough support programs, enough supporting partnerships to continue to, to continue to build that growth inside your organization. And that's where you go from military friendly to military ready to career. So you have to take and be able to take and step those. Absolutely. And, and to, to, to piggyback on what Chris said, cause he's absolutely right. 
once you hire one and then you hire another, now you have people inside your organization that you've already vetted are part of the thing and where you can ask them those questions about military hiring. And I'm not saying they have to be subject matter experts on all of the processes and input for you know, talent acquisition or HR. However, it is helpful to ask the people that have actually lived it how they can do it better, right? So you take that feedback from inside internally, what you've done, and then you extrapolate that to the rest of it. And then you start to get involved with organizations like Hiring Our Heroes and you know hiring events on military bases. And then you start, because the translations from service to civilian, that is the biggest barrier that everyone leaving the military sees. And that is the hardest hurdle for organizations to overcome in the hiring process is how do skills align to skills, right? Like Chris talked about, he was a combat engineer. Um, so for those of, I mean, like, so if you tell the company, he's got 26 years of experience, leadership, all of these things, and he's a combat engineer, they're going to be like, that's awesome. I have no idea what that is. None. None. But then I you, don't have that job. I have no right. combat jobs available yes. for you, Chris, right? That is, and it's interesting because there are lots of programs that exist for people exiting to help them translate to employers, right? You see mm -hmm. these military.com has it. There's lots of um, agencies have built these programs, but what you don't see, at least I haven't seen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm definitely not an expert here is programs to really help companies translate backwards. And, and besides people named Steve, um, right? That, but this is the, the challenge is that when you go to go source out of a resume database, for example, right? We are not sourcing for, for a combat engineer, but you do, there are so many transferable skills. And this is actually the broader problem in our, in our hiring ecosystem right now is the transferable skill approach and how does one go about thinking this person's experience in these type, types of things are foundational in a way that you are now capable of learning the next step or the next set of skills that we need. Yeah. And, and we, we coach the candidate and the company at the same time. So we truly are a facilitator of quality outcomes on both behalves, right? So when we talk to the candidate, we always like we encourage them to understand how their skills translate to the civilian world and they have to be able to speak to it. Because if you get on a phone screen, you're not gonna have Steve sitting next to you as much as you want, right? To say, well, this is what Joe Schmuckatelli can actually do. This is what this means. Like if you can't articulate it, you can't get somebody to understand it, which means you can't get hired. Now, when we go to companies and a lot of this burden is always put on the, the organizations because it's easy to pick out companies and say, you have to understand, you have to do this. It's, it's about them understanding, but them also listening to the candidate as it comes, as they come through and saying like, oh, I understand what that means to me and the value to our organization, right? So I'm going to give you a little bit of grace when you put in your resume that you're a platoon sergeant versus like a program development leader or some other, you know, like civilianized term for a platoon sergeant. So kind of understanding those correlations and then the ranks to what they do in the civilian world, like those type of things. But it is it is a both sides problem, not just an organizational yeah. entity problem. And I think that's where it goes back to when you're talking military ready, military friendly to military ready, because then you're doing you're talking and training your HR teams. They're going through the coursework to understand those pieces, Steve. And then you take and turn around. So my job is to sit down and say, okay, look, let me explain to you a soldier career path. And we'll just use truck driver example. Okay, that individual is going to come to the military, go through over 200 hours of training before even put them inside a truck. You know, simulators, everything. Bring them in. Oh, by the way, we're training those young men and women to be able to take and drive down the Audubon in Europe. All right. And, you know, go amongst the cars and driving, driving tanks, vehicles, whichever, on convoys for nine and a half hours. Then we turn them around, bring them in as team leaders. So now they're managing three to five people, three to five trucks all the equipment, getting them from route A to route B, from point A to point B. And then we take and turn them as squad leader where, where they're now running section. And then, you know, then we talk about recruiters, becoming drill sergeants, trained developers. There's that whole career path. Unfortunately, the way that the civilian society views military is, oh, you went to war and you carried a gun. So it's really up to that veteran program to be able to take and turn around and say, hey, let's explain what these service members bring. Oh, by the way, let's talk about these soft skills and transferable skills that they actually bring into, into the workplace. 
That's why it's critically, critically important when you take and start up a program realizing, hey, we're just not hiring for entry level roles. We're hiring for every single role inside an organization. Because if I don't have where if I don't have managers, directors, VPs that are veterans inside that organization, then there is nobody that's going to be in there championing champion those roles for the organization. So it has to be created and it has to be developed inside an organizational structure. You just said something really interesting, right? When you think about most organizations, the amount of training that we do to help ensure that we're not interviewing with bias, that we are not asking questions that are going to get ourselves in trouble, right? We do a lot of training to help our hiring managers and our recruiters really do a great job with interviewing. And yet we don't do a ton in this particular area. And I think what you just said, or at least the way I heard it was, you're going to be serious about this. You're not going to just say we're military hiring, but we're actually military ready. Training has to be at the forefront of that process. And you have to really invest in the business to make sure that the, the interviewing group knows what they're asking and knows what they're doing as part of that conversation. Am I, am I articulating that correctly? Yeah. And it's hard because if you take a talk to any HR team, it's going to be like, well, when do we get the training in? When is there time? And there's actually a, I don't have the actual link, but I'll drop it in. There's actually a LinkedIn learning for hiring managers and senior leaders, but it's a 43 minute course, you know? So it's like, Hey, can you take the 43 minutes to be able to take and get up to speed? You know, cause yeah. think about this, even if you're talking university, if you're talking military, it's really the same thing. You're just trying to put the most professional product out front to be able to take and attract the most talent. So, you know, you need to take and develop that on other side. And, and the, the, the statistic that is mind blowing around this conversation, right? Because generally when, when we hire and when we interview, we, we gravitate towards people that have shared experiences that we did, right? You know, so like in the great state of Wisconsin, you're talking about like, they want to hire a farm kid because they, they correlate a farm kid with somebody that's going to work hard, show up, get the job done, right? And, and just do the work. So it's because they've all had experience and been exposed to farmers. Now, the, the data point is 80% of the United States population has no direct connection to anyone who has served in the United States military. So that, that means like they don't, they don't know someone that has served. They don't have a family member that has served. They don't have an uncle that has served. I mean, so when we talk about that, you're looking at, you're looking at 20% of the population right? That has that experience. And so when you're building out that hiring program, if you don't have someone or know someone that has that shared experience, you're probably not going to like have an affinity for it or relate to it. It's an interesting challenge, right? Because that's, there is a lot of parallels in companies who are growing fast and trying to build in better diversity programs. It's actually very similar in, in some of the challenges of making people and forcing them out of their comfort zone to, to embrace alternative folks that you've not necessarily been, you know, they're not the people you play golf with or they're not the people that live next door. And, and that doesn't make them a bad hire. In fact, it might make them a better hire, but it's a really hard, uh, shift for a lot of people, individuals to make. Chris, and then, Lee, oh, really, quick to you, really quick to your point on that, the United States military is 33% more diverse than the population that it serves, right? So when, when we, when we talk about, so you talked about one struggle in that, in that diversity hiring folk, part, yeah. but like now you're multiplying it by a factor of three, right? And to, to, to build that program. So it's not just one issue you're overcoming. It's, a multitude of them, which makes it even more challenging to your point. Yeah. Now, I w just a little bit of a shift. Chris, you are also a military spouse. This is something I found out about you early on. And I know, Steve, you do a lot with also hiring military spouses, which is different, but also a really interesting challenge for companies to get their head around. How do you bring on people who might get moved in a minute? And why should you do this? And what is the value? So I want to tackle that piece. And then I do actually want to come back to something really very important to me, which is the suicide rate that exists in exiting military members and why hiring is so important for those statistics. So I want to make sure we touch on both those topics. But let's jump into military spouses for a little bit. Chris, On the military I hear your, your wife is amazing. 
Yeah, my wife is amazing. It's interesting because she actually manages the depot here in El Paso for all equipment that comes to West Mississippi and then goes back out to the Reserves and National Guard. You know, but if you sit down and talk with her, you know, or if she tried to get a job in the outside from what she currently does, they'd they'd be like, Well, you know, she really doesn't understand. But you're talking about thousands of pieces of equipment, sets, kits, and inventory, sets, kits, and yep. uh, outfits. So tremendous. When you look at military spouses, the interesting piece is most are going through, and I'm, I'll use Hiring Our Heroes as an example. They're going through Hiring Our Heroes programs. They're going to, through Onward to Opportunity programs. They're getting licenses. They're getting certifications. They're getting education. They're getting grooming. Uh, most are degree-bearing. For the ones that are not degree-bearing, it's because they have, they want to take and get into that field. They want to take and get out there and show how, how they can perform. Where I think a lot of spouses are, yes, some do move. But a lot of the larger organizations, we have structures in those locations. So that military spouse, the same way that they're willing to pick up and move with their family, you know, change schools, households, homes, everything, that shows me that they're resilient and that they can take an app and they can take and change within those environments. Then when you take a look at the other side of military spouses, now we have to think about the reserves, National Guard, Guardsmen, because those folks are already set in those communities. So they're not going anywhere. And then you tier which is the retired military spouses now those folks now use my hr location charleston south carolina is a great example out of joint base charleston if i can take and find military spouses that have an hr background that is a perfect fit for me that's somebody that's there that's somebody that knows they're retiring and plan on staying in, in place the next 20 years so do you not want that stability with that family member or that military spouse also behind it when you take a look at it we're really starting to get in front of the, the veteran hiring rate. We're trying to get the veteran uh, employment percentages down low, but we really need to start paying attention to the veteran spouse uh, unemployment rate, which is actually at 20%. That impacts a lot of families, a lot of households. So as we get into the mental health, as we get into the suicide and those other conversations, that is one of those variables that tie in. And then the further conversation would be military dependence. Because when you take a look generally, generationally what is happening, a lot of family members are now still living with that household much longer. So if you can employ and show value, make somebody and show them self-worth, how much, how much further are you going to take and move those military families and uh, empower the military community? So that's why it's uh, critically important for us right now. There's a lot of programs in, in the U.S. that, that especially for government contractors, right? We do the OCCP contract where, and we do WOTC programs to try to encourage companies to collect and report this information, but then also to hire and provide tax credits and incentives. But it's interesting because they don't touch on military spouses, right? That isn't one of the things we're measuring. It's not one of the things we're tracking. It's not one of the things we're asking companies to report on and there's no incentive on the other side. Do you think that that is part of the, that the government needs to interfere and, and sort of have a position on that? Or like we were talking earlier, sometimes when the government with best intentions, creates unintentional consequences. And I think uh, I'll let you two talk about, it, but there's a, a, a new initiative that we were talking about prior to jumping on here that I think is interesting uh, for everyone to be aware of. So I'll let you two, because you guys are experts and I am not. Steve, if you want to go military spouses, then I'll back piggyback on the military spouse piece on legislation. And then if you want to dive into uh, skill, the skill bridge uh, update, we can go that route. Yeah, excellent. So uh, military spouses present a, a very unique opportunity in hiring, both a unique opportunity and hurdle in the fact that the majority of them are very well educated, more so than their civilian counterparts, but they're amazingly transient due to the nature of the military. They have to move every three years. So their skill set is often being overlooked because they lack experience that directly correlates to positions that they are uniquely qualified for while maintaining that level of education and professionalism. They find it as a challenge to continue to have that experience that they need to get the roles that they're actually suited for because of their transient nature of marrying an active duty service member. So when companies are looking to hire, they're seeing an overqualified candidate and an underexperienced candidate all at the same time, which leads to that kind of disconnect, which is, goes back to the translating, just like translating military experience to the civilian hiring world, understanding military spouses Right. And the fact that they don't have the experience oftentimes, but they have the skill set to do it, it's because of the nature of the lifestyle that they live with their family. And supporting them in that, it's it's the same conversation around understanding, right? And being able to have some 
an advocate for them in that conversation during the hiring process. It's fascinating, right? Because it, you just said something, which is like they, they, three years they have to move. And so companies are a little like, ooh, they might leave. And what's funny about that is if you look at average tenure at a lot of companies, right? Uh, I think the, the BLS will tell us right now it's running at about four years. Well, four years is the average, not the minimum. And in service industries and a lot of our hourly workforce, right, it's closer to a year. And actually... It's not uncommon, especially in anyone that's in their first decade of their employment, even in the white collar workforce, or what I call the desk workforce, you're still looking at an average tenure of two, two and a half years. So it's actually not, it shouldn't be, it's, it shouldn't be, but yeah, it's an interesting bias that we have adopted in our hiring. And I think that's another one, right? As you think about training is like, how do you unwind that bias? Cause the data doesn't support that being a, a valid bias. Lee, at some point, it feels like the sunk cost fallacy, right? Like, we're just, yeah. we're going to invest so much in them that we can't let them leave, except for they're going to leave anyway, no matter how much you invest in them, right? They, I think the average tenure is like three to five years, right? And you switch jobs nine times um, yeah. throughout your career. It's 4.1 years right now uh, yeah. as of 2023. So yeah, we're... So, we're... So, so you're right there. So when you're hiring a military spouse, right? And then everybody talks about like portability. So if you're looking at a national employer and that military spouse like fits a role that you have open and they have the skill set for it, why can't they go from location to location with that national employer, right? I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense that you want to make it somewhat portable during their circumstance, which would then, I mean, like Chris will tell you, it'll increase retention in the military, right? Like all of those things as we, you know, turn into, you know, like the recruiting crisis, gross GWAT, all of those, that stuff. But this goes back into the, the programmatic element of the transition, right? When we talk about DOD skill bridge. Yeah, when you look at the retention, it's interesting because there was a huge amount that was spent on unemployment. A lot of people don't realize the Department of Defense, when service members transition, that they're actually paying that unemployment out of the out of the DOD budget. When you take a look at the success of retention, if you have a military spouse that has a job, has a career, and that military spouse is successful, then that service member can take and still continue on. Unfortunately, I think a lot of service members, when they take a look at the outside, they're forgetting about all the benefits that actually come with that military package that they really do have. So it, it's, it's hand in hand. My wife and I had the same conversation years ago. And unfortunately we made the choice, you know, where I went and I was a Sergeant major for the four, years, you know, and I lived apart from my family and I drove back on weekends and that's the other piece of it. You will see that sacrifice from military families to try and take and keep that career in place, especially towards the tail end of the career. The piece that I would tell you, though, is when you take a look at the growth and the opportunities, I've seen a lot of military spouses, you know, and we hired one as an example at uh, Fort Liberty last year, and we reached out. She was marketing on our marketing team for 11 months. We worked with her. We knew the transition plan was at the end of that year. We said, hey, if you're ready to transition at the end of the year, we can hire you and we'll move you up to Upper Marlboro. So a lot more organizations, and I'll tell you right now, I know Lowe's does a great job. Lowe's a military spouse and says at an installation, they'll pick up and they'll military spouse location, you know, and that's part of that career ready phase. It's those organizations that are trying to make sure they can do it. We just had another military spouse that we were put into a virtual role, remote role, so that they could take and do a permanent change of station to another location. So it's just adaptability. You know, we watched the, the success and the failure, you know, it's good and bad of the remote and virtual market, you know, but if it's the right person, I'm the right fit. I think that organizations can be flexible for that right candidate. So rounding that out, we were talking about the legislation and the support, yeah. right, around, you know, so I do see, so I see a lot of companies actually lean very far into WOTC, right? The Work Opportunity Tax Credit, for anyone that's unfamiliar, this is a program that does provide companies a tax credit. Sometimes it takes a little while to get it, even if you file the paperwork correctly, by state and varying amounts per, per employee that you hire that fall under certain criteria. Now, being a retired military person is one of the criteria being disabled actually is another one, but there are other pieces to the work opportunity tax credit includes things like if you are hiring somebody who is currently on benefits such as um, WIC 
is a good example. It also does support X cons and it does support people in certain zip codes that are considered disadvantaged. So it's an overarching program, but it does have some very key benefits for some organizations that do a lot of hiring, especially post-military hiring. We see, I actually am familiar with a number of organizations that fund a significant part of their recruiting operation through these tax credits. So it's something to think about, right? But as we look at that and we say, okay, that's one program. And obviously we have the OFCCP, which tracks, I'm not sure so much it does more than that, but it does track it. What do you guys see as opportunity for companies to, is it, is it legislation? Is it, or is it, is it requirements? Is it regulation? Is it, we just want people to be good citizens. How do we get all the alignment that we need both for exiting military and, and the spouses that we were talking about? I mean, like in, in, in my case, I'm a keep it simple, stupid guy. And maybe that's my Marine Corps background. Right. But like, you just have to have a want to, right. So government has never fixed anything, you know, like the, 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 the nine worst words you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help because all of their good intentions lead to bad outcomes for the most part. Like we talked about earlier before this started. So thinking about it, like if the company wants to, they just need to identify it. And then they need to say, okay, we want to hire veterans. We want to hire spouses. We want to do this. And it's for no other reason than it is a great source of talent. Like veterans on average have a higher post-secondary degree rate than their civilian counterparts. Same with military spouses. We always talk about college as a qualifier, not because of the degree that they got in most fields, but as the fact that they completed something for four years. Well, let me tell you about the 1% of the population that like took an oath, raised their right hand and completed something for at least four years, right? Like those cats have shown up in a way that most people haven't. So like that mental toughness, the, you know, the work ethic, all those soft skills that we don't talk about, but the reason companies should hire military talent and military spouses is because they've proven themselves time and time again in a way that most of the population never will. I think when you look at the policies that have been passed here recently, and I'll say really recently, like within three years, you'll see the licensure certifications effort. But I think coming today is that this Chamber of Commerce, that's how our heroes, you know, so now there is a military spouse program for 11 weeks where you can have a military spouse brought in for coordinate through U.S. Chamber of Commerce and hiring our heroes. That is one of those programs that's been put in place. You have the military spouse partnership. There is over 220,000 military spouses with resume in that database currently looking for work. When you take in U.S. Fastport, which is stepping forward for apprenticeship programs for military veterans and mil military spouses, there are a ton of organizations that are out there trying to take in, uh, utilize these efforts. I think on the uh, part of employers, I just don't think they fully know how to take in, get into these organizations, how to build it out, and how to show the hiring managers there's value inside these systems. So I think the systems are finally there. I think the programs are finally there, but it comes down to adoption. You know, how is that organization going to become career ready and actually buy into that? When I look at us right now, we're going through that build right now. You know, I'm going to Upper Marlboro, Maryland next week to sit down with uh, Capital Electric. We're doing a two-day hiring event tied into recruit military hiring event. But part of that initiative is bringing hiring our heroes on site. We have Maryland Workforce Development coming on site to show them what our distribution center looks like and bring them in and tie them. Because I think when you take in local organizational-wise, and I'll use Upper Marlboro as an example, there are 20 workforce development offices that are state and federally funded within that 20 mile footprint that have never been inside that organization. So partnering with those organizations, getting them to feed in and utilizing that thing that is already out there where the company doesn't have to take and spend money. The programs are there. It just comes down to adoption, in my opinion. I think there's a thing there though, right? As you, as you start to build out a program like this, you do have to have somebody like yourself who really owns it, right? And I laugh a little bit at you when we chat every time because you're a road warrior. I feel like every time I talk to you, you're like, all right, I'm coming from here. I'm going here. It's like your calendar is the comical like hodgepodge of where, where in the world is Chris today? How does a company really get the person? Who, how do they find you? How do they find a you where you have somebody who can lean into building this program who recognizes it's not a uh, sit at your desk and just search databases and move paper, but really you have to get out into the community. You have to be part of the solution. You have to actually do the outreach, the bridge component of this. 
I would tell, well, one, I know 20 other people just like me that I could take and refer. So just reach out to me. But it comes down, if you're interviewing and you just don't, like, this is not a 40-hour week job. You know, like, if I, my wife laughs, she's like, oh, well, how many was that? I said it was about a 65-hour work week, not talk, and not including travel. You know, but if you don't have a passion, you know, I, whenever I talk to my boss, Charlene, she's like, you know, what is the value you bring to the organization? I said, it's my Rolodex, my contact, my passion, and, and my drive. I made commitments to veterans when I transitioned out of the military that I would continue to serve. You know, I'm a soldier for life. Steve is a Marine for life. You know, it's the same thing. We have that passion. You know, since 2018 till now, I've assisted to hire over 4,000 veterans. You know, and I'm going to hire 4,000 more and 4,000 more. You know, but if you're hiring somebody and it just seems like it's going to be a 40 hour week job, that's not the right thing. And you're going to know right away when you have these programs, you know, interesting enough, I'm one person for an entire organization right now. And a lot of programs are one person deep, but you have to take and work to build out. Okay. Let's build out a team that can center in on California. Let's build out a team for the West coast, central East coast. My West Coast team is phenomenal. We've built that. Now we're working on, you know, our central team and our East Coast team. You have to have buy-in. I really think it comes down to employee resource groups, though. Stand up a military employer, employee resource group inside your organization that is connected to your other employee resource groups. And, you know, Selena, our DNI director, she's helped us build that within the organization. Percent of my events, I've had employee resource group members attend those events and help take and drive that conversation at our events. Chris, at this point, because you've been doing this at Sonopar for a while, and I know you did it before uh, with the ADP group working for some of your RPO clients. Um, Have you been able to build out the data that another organization could use to say to their team, like, this is the impact. This is why something like this isn't just good for the people coming out of the military, but it's good for the business too. Yes. You know, and, and I, how I know that we did that is last, we were a year and a half into our program. We sat down a military spouse employment partner member. We sat down military.com number 36 in the nation for military friendly. And we just received from the DAV, the excellence in veteran hiring. When I look at the build though, it's because, you know, share a presentation with anybody that shows like, Hey, Here's how you you become military friendly, military ready, career ready. And it's kind of the build. But you have to stick to that path. You know, it's funny sometimes to be like, hey, this information. I'm like, but I got another 4,500 people to take and connect with and talk to. You know, but really it comes down to finding those true partners. There's a lot of folks out there that say, hey, I'm here to help. But you'll never hear from those folks. But coming down and find out the quality individuals that you continue continually reach like I said, I'm going to Upper Marlboro. It was the last trip. I reached out to the Hiring Our Heroes rep out of D.C., and she's coming on site next Monday for the tour. But it's because of that commitment we have with, with each other to help out. Steve and I get done on this call. We're both heading to Fort Bliss for Hiring Our Heroes event to go hire veterans here in two hours. You know, So it's about that commitment. And, yes, I do have stats and numbers. I can't share those on the call. But, you know, I, I can show you how to take and get there. Debbie, like, I think that that is the thing for most organizations. It's not the person who wants to build the program. It's the person they need them to say yes to, that they need the help in getting that argument tight, made through numbers and data that allows organizations to say this is an easy one to say yes to. I'm just conscious of time, so I want to make sure we get to the last topic that I had sort of floated out there. I had the pleasure of meeting a woman many years ago who spent a good amount of her time helping folks coming out of Pendleton, interviewing and transitioning. She hired lots and lots of people who who had experience on helicopters and and airplanes to work on civilian helicopters and airplanes. And she and I had a number of conversations. She ended up getting the presidential accommodation for a lot of the work she had done, being not a military vet, nor even a spouse of, but actually a, a family of was around really impacting the suicide rate that exists from our exiting military. So she and her passion got me really focused and excited about how to help in that way. And so 
it's a big problem here in the US. Uh, it's not the, the, everyone's favorite topic, but I would like to touch on a little bit about why employment is so important when we look at our exiting service members. And I'm gonna let the two of you sort of take the floor on that. Yeah, think about the three things that are leading indicators of death by suicide, right? We talk about rela relationship dislocation, economic impact and loss of job, right? So when you transition from the United States military, you've in those all three of those are impacted in a very, very severe and immediate way. And then when we talk about the hardest part about leaving the military is finding that next gig, right? Like finding that job. So you're told, you know, in my case, I was told from the day I was born that I'm special, but it had made, had something to do with the helmet I wore to school. Maybe it was the fact that, you know, it was just me. It's your pretty but face, like, man. It was the pretty it. face. But in the Marine Corps, we are the few, we are the proud, right? So when you get out and you start firing off resumes, like my Twitter feed, right, into the ether in which nobody reads it, nobody sees it, your sense of self becomes uniquely less. And then you become detached from your support system, which were, you know, your crew in the military, like the people that you rode with, your sense of purpose is gone. And you start to think about like, why am I even here, right? So that leads to a spiral of depression in which you feel like your only choice is, you know, to not be here anymore. So if we're talking about what they need the most when they get out of service, they need one, someone that can help mentor them through that process, right? Like be it somebody that was in their unit that left, but they need somebody to talk to just to have those honest conversations. But that job is the first step in a sense of purpose that somebody else wants because they've done the hardest thing that they're ever going to do in their life. And the second hardest thing is leaving the military. And sometimes those are reversed. But when when that job happens, you all of a sudden have a sense of purpose. You start to rebuild a team, a sense of community. Sebastian Younger, when he talked about tribe and the importance of tribe, especially in the military community, we, we are brothers and sisters forever. Like Chris and I could, you know, we could have met anywhere and instantly had a bond because we had both served different branches, different times, different length of time, but we had that shared experience. So when you leave the military, you don't know who those people are anymore, and you don't know where to find them. And part of us, because of what was drilled into us during our time in service is we don't ask for help. So we sit there drowning in a sea of life preservers, refusing to grab one. I would tell you as a combat veteran, con like nothing else that you're going to experience it's you have your highs and you have your lows and sometimes you do find yourself craving to take and go back to that and then even when you're back with your families it's just something that you can't take and explain and even like when you're combat brothers you know we see here and say hey we'll always have each other's backs we'll always be there well geographically once people separate some of those relationships do diminish but once you face you can always pick those up inside organizations and we could have suicide conversation the you know traumatic conversation ptsd it there's a certain portion of this sector of, that's always going to happen let me hit up p first ptsd because it's one of the topics that does come up ptsd is just in civilian society is a military society you know so that's just one of those myths that's out there the suicide rate unfortunately it is there there's nothing that truly explains it because you do have chain of commands now that are more passionate. A lot of the combat deployments have drawn back, you know, so hopefully as we take and see that draw down, so it will fix itself out. But I think it's a very important to continue to take and support veteran stations. I know Bob Witter Foundation is, has campaigns on this, talk with DFW American Legion. Everybody's trying to get in front of this. Interesting enough, I just had a conversation with Regiment Gaming they're doing a big piece with the younger veterans now to tie them gaming so they have those connections but i think part of this again is important you know so we use adapt which is one of our uh, employee resource groups that talks about disabilities we leverage that with our military employee resource group we have those open honest conversations if somebody needs somewhere and someone needs a conversation we have it internally but we're also sharing those external links you know there is no that has figured this problem out if we did this is something we could fix but i don't think that it's a dry iron veterans i actually think it's an actual 
because a lot of veterans now are actually out. You see when the PACT Act came out from, from uh, VA, you did see a lot more veterans step forward and actually start asking for help. A lot of veterans that were at outreach centers outside of the VA hospitals are now drawn back into the VA hospitals so that we can make sure that they're actually getting help and just not going to appointments to check the block. Steve, I think you said it. It doesn't matter where you are. If you ran into Chris, you guys would would connect, right? And I think that the employee resource groups are an incredible way to help build that infrastructure inside the organization. I think the key is how do we as a, a society extend that? And I think Chris, this is a lot of what your work you do and see what you do to sort of help those people leaving the military or those who have worked there to understand that those exist and like it is a, a process it is an outreach they are you're outreaching to them but they have to come back to you as well and then getting into the organization will provide more than just the job that you need that sense of familiar it's actually the community you're looking for yeah um, well and, and, and so if you think about ergs and the values of it and you know that to that point about connection you know like that and that community building the ERGs don't have to be on the front line of talent acquisition, nor do they have to be part of the hiring process. But if you get a candidate that is a veteran or has identified themselves as serving in the United States Armed Forces, like having somebody in that ERG just reach out and say, hey, brother, sister, whatever, I'll work here. If you want to hear anything about it, just uh, shoot me an email. That goes a very long way. And it is actually, it's like a best practice for starting to build that positive impact in the community because then instead of that service member thinking that no one actually cares, right? They have somebody at a company that has said, hey, like you might not get hired here and I'm not part of the talent part, but like, I would love to talk to you and, you know, let me just share my experience because knowing that somebody else has done it, right? Helps you to do it as well. So, so that's it. It's an easy way. Like my second favorite four letter F word is free. So it is, it is one of those, ways where you can make a big impact in your organization and give value to the ERG at minimal cost to none. Steve, it's also my second favorite F word, so I'm with you on this. Yeah, right. Uh, and surprisingly uh, enough, food is not my first. Oh, I have a competing two first then. You've uh, now uh, made this harder. Oh, you've made it. Uh, we're, we're hitting up on time. Does, I don't know if anyone on the on the, the group here has anything that they'd like to jump in with. Yes. It's from everybody. My favorite word is from. As we are just rounding out, Chris, Steve, are there any final sort of words or thoughts that you'd like to provide as we we finish up this conversation today? If you have anybody that comes out and says that they're a subject matter ex in military hiring, military program to you, these programs are ever adapting. The programs are ever changing. Keep in mind that your transition assistance programs, they change on contracts, your local veteran employment reps change, your pay, it's continually changing. So you have to continually reaching out. You have a database, like all these organizations, those contacts are all changing on a constant basis. So the maintenance phase of your military program is the most important. You have to continually keep maintaining. I call it a coffee pot. I pour in my water, but I always need coffee. You know, so I need all those these all those different organizations to keep coming back into my coffee pot so that I can continually have a flow. Steve. When we like final words, we always talk about like especially in transition and networking gets thrown around a lot, right? But the key to networking is digging the well before you need the water. And this goes to the hiring space. This goes to everything, right? So you got to be present in the space in order to do it correctly. Nobody shows up the day after they graduate from college and say like, hey, I wanna hire an engineer. Like you've been on campus for four years, right? They know you, they feel comfortable with you. A lot of it comes down to marketing, but more importantly, it comes down to relationships. So what Chris was saying was absolutely right. In the military hiring community, especially things change, but relationships always remain. Like Rachel is on this meeting, you know, from the Manufacturing Institute and Heroes Make America. And those are two great programs. And I met her probably 2018, right? Because the great state of Wisconsin has the second highest concentration of advanced manufacturing in the nation. So it was just a natural segue. And I'm pretty sure at that point, she worked for the USO. But like the point is the people in the space that have the passion for it always remain tangentially involved. So building relationships and being involved is the way to help improve the hiring process. 
I would say, you know, Chris, probably you and Steve both exemplify the networking component, but that isn't networking on a LinkedIn message, right? You guys are in the community, you're outreaching, you are physically present. And I think that is probably the biggest, for me, takeaway of how you guys have built these programs is that it isn't something that is a desk job that you can just do. You have to be part of the community, you have to lean in, you have to show up and you have to be available. So that would be my sort of biggest takeaway from my from my time with you guys, which is definitely not enough time, but I, it's so impressed with the passion behind it that allows you to then say, yeah, I do need to make that, that plane trip. I got to get there. I need to be physically there. So I, both of you, thank you both for your service. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you everybody who joined us. We are going to do another one of these next month. I have somebody who's joining us. His name is Gary Noak. He is a multiple CEO. This is, I think his fourth company that he's currently at. And he's going to talk about how you build recruiting as a culture in the whole business. And part of why I love him as a speaker is because one of his businesses was a staffing firm early in his career. And so obviously recruiting is in his blood. So it is going to be an interesting chat around how do you then operationalize recruitment all the way through your business. So everyone is doing it. Everyone's embracing it. You bring recruiting to the forefront. So that will be September 19th, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And I hope everybody is able to join us for that. And thank you guys. Thank, thank you both for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you everybody who joined us today. This is recorded. We'll send it out later with all of these links. And Chris, I noticed that you were putting all of the things into the chat. Thank you. We will include all of that in the follow-up email. So thank you all and appreciate it.